Good morning, family. It's good to see you. Let's stand and praise God together. Good morning. My name is Mike, AKA clicker of sticks, <laughs> maker of loud noises. Um, this morning we're going into the topic of sanctification. Um, and as such, I wanted to help lead us into some worship uh, of a responsive prayer. Um, so if you will read with me, um, I will read the leader part as we respond uh, with the rest. In our sanctification, we are set apart from this world, made unique and distinct. It is in this sanctification where we are declared justified and righteous by faith. O oh Lord, fill me afresh with the power of your spirit, in Jesus' name. Just as the sunset painted against the sky gives our breath pause, so too shall the beauty of your grace move our hearts to love. O oh Lord, by the help of your spirit, 
Let my life reflect the life of God in Jesus' name. Let your grace wash over me and fill me so that I may do your work without expectation. Our sanctification requires constant reorienting ourselves to our justification. Every day your mercies are new. It is in this way that the surpassing power is yours alone. Oh Lord, help me realign my life daily in the ways of your will by the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
You may be seated. Can't help but hear that song and think about, man, what it's, what's it going to be like when we bust through the gates of heaven, <laughs> when we get to hear a thousand hallelujah, hundred thousands of hallelujahs. What a beautiful sound that will be. Well, so glad you guys are here. Good morning. And um, today is, is interesting. It is something called National College and Young Adult Day. In, in the church world. Some of you are going, really? Come on, we have a national pancake day and we have a national talk like a pirate day. So this, uh, this makes sense and I'm glad that they have it because it, it's worth having. Thank God for it. Well, the young adult years, age 18 to 25, have been what I call a black hole in a lot of churches for a long time. Why is this? Well, guess what? It's a tough demographic to reach. A Barna study showed that about 76% of faithful going youth group kids kind of drop off the map right after 18. And uh, why? Well, nobody's holding their hand, kind of taking them uh, to church anymore. It, it's almost like a, a dog realizing the gates left open, Pew, gone. <laughs> and I think all of us kind of understand that, you know? And, and the thing is, it used to be that folks would step away from the church, you know, and get some life experience which is really important. You know, think back to your life. You know, there are probably times some of your biggest mistakes and some of your biggest growths happened in this 18 to 25 range. And uh, it's kind of important. And it used to be in their 30s, they'd kind of return, kind of start coming, migrating back to church once they start kind of growing up and having families. And they go, man, you know, that really was a good thing. And for the first time they go, wow, I really need Jesus in my life. And um, the sad thing is they're saying that's happening less and less. Less and less are they returning. That's terrifying. That, that scares me, that should scare you. The future, you know, is, is <laughs> greatly impacted by this. Well, it's scary. That's why, honestly, I cherish and value, man, the time that we have with our young adults. They're amazing in so many ways. Um, and by the way, I'm Tim. I run the college young adult ministry here <laughs> and a little context. But uh, so, well, a little bit about our group. Our, our group is laser focused on Christ and community. And our gatherings are big on discussion. You know, truly believe that the unique college and career times, you know, it, it's some of the most critical in a person's life. This is the years of identity formation and spiritual exploration. You know, so we exist to reach the lost equip the found and faithfully follow God's word. I think that's so important to have a place where, you know, we can have a lesson and discussion and go back and forth and they can process, ask questions, think things through. So we, we do in-depth Bible studies, we do apologetics, we discuss current events and what God in the Bible has to say about all that's going on. We teach from a Christian worldview, but also discuss other views as well. My desire is that we help form critical thinkers to evaluate this life and what's happening in the world. I mean, think about it. So many times people are arguing just from one side and they don't take the time to get to know, you know, why people think differently, why they believe what they believe. Jesus was so good about meeting people where they are, you know, building a relationship and speaking the truth. I think that's just so important that we understand, that we listen to one another, but ultimately, you know, that we choose to live as faithful followers of Christ and his teachings. So we also do life coaching stuff. We study things like dating and marriage and mental health and awareness and how to cope with trials in life because we all face them. We also do fun community stuff. We just went to Dave and Buster's last week. We've done snow tubing, scavenger hunts, escape room, passion conference in Atlanta, concerts, worship conference, pool parties, barbecues, all that. So if you know someone in this age group, please invite them out. Help them, help them get in contact with me or just show up here. Sundays at six o'clock, we're up in a room up there called the lounge. It's a free dinner for everybody that comes. And uh, we make church fun, a lot of fun. A time of learning and growth and relationship building with one another. It's awesome. It's absolutely awesome. And guess what? It's because of generosity. It's because of people like you that help support the church and its many, many, many ministries going on. And uh, with that, hey, offering. 
<laughs> four ways to give this morning uh, and every day this week. Uh, first, online, you can go to fbclakeland.org. Um, click on tap there and, and donate. You can also text, text give to, what's the number, 51055. It's see, I do it on purpose. That way they say it and people remember it. It's good. Yes, and it's wonderful. And you can text to give. You can also snail mail. You can mail it into the church. And of course, we've got receptacle bins in the back. And uh, I just thank you guys. Thank you so much. You, you are helping to reach a, a generation that's often swept under, you know, and looked over. And it's so critical that, that we reach, uh, reach out to this group. So let's have a word of prayer this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for life. Thank you for breath. We woke up today. We, we managed to get here. God, thank you so much for our minds that we can think, that we can actively think about concepts of you and make choices, God, that hopefully lead us closer to you. I just thank you, God. It's, it's a wonder that you care about us, that you love us so, so much. Lord, I wanna start off by just saying, man, forgive us of our sins for we know that there are many. God, help us to just rejoice in repentance and every day cling to you. It's a system that you designed. God, we're going to have struggles. We're going to have trials. And it's on purpose, God. It helps us reach out to you. It helps us to need you. So, God, I just pray that you would help us to, to, to fight like strong warriors, God. That we would not give up. That we would not stop running this race of faith, God. But no, man that you've got us, that you are holding us, that you are cheering us on, God, that you are calling us to a better way and a better life. Father, I, I pray, forgive us for our lust for more, God, for coveting, for a lack of contentment. God, help us to be more consumed with someone's salvation rather than our next big purchase. Man, Lord, we need you. We've made comfort such an idol. <laughs> Lord, I just pray, turn our hearts to you. Give us hearts and eyes to see people, to see the opportunities all around us, to see the needs all around us. God, help, help us get out of ourselves. I just pray, Lord, that you would just help us to overcome fear. Fear controls so much of our life and our decisions. God, so many times we, we are so used to trying to be in control and play God ourselves. And if fear or objection or, or obstacle is in our way, God, too often we just, we just give up. God, I just pray that you would help us to lean on you, lean into you, God, include you in our lives, Lord, that we would not live a life out of fear, but God, that we would live a life of boldness, God, a life of faith, a life that speaks to your existence, a life that shines light, proof of you, God, Father, help us to not neglect those in need to the hurting, the lonely. God, I just pray that you would just remind them how valuable they are to you. No matter how hard life gets, no matter how hard beaten down, man, they're still valuable because they are a child of God. I pray, God, help us to endure no matter what the challenge is, God, whether it's kids, job, anything, Lord. Help us, Lord to shoo away the distraction, the noise of this world and focus in on you. God, we love you so much. And just pray your hand over this service, over everyone here this morning. God, we just pray that you would just bless Pastor Zach as he brings the word, speak through him, that we may understand more about you, more about your love. In Jesus' name, amen. How can our hearts not respond in gratitude with what Jesus has done for us? Let's stand and praise him together.
you for this time that we have together to come and praise you for everything that you've done, everything that you're doing, everything that you will do in our lives, that while we were yet sinners, you came anyway, that we did nothing and you did everything. Lord, be in the mouth of Pastor Zach this morning. May he open your word to our ears, open our minds to your understanding, that we may go this week and apply what we've learned with new gratitude and excitement. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Tyson. Jesus, Jesus paid it all. Aren't those like the four best words ever? Yeah. Only for Brian Morgan. <laughs> Everybody else is just kind of, that's all right. I mean, seriously, Jesus paid it all. Everything. What did he pay for? You and I are terrible, messed up individuals. And not just Brian Morgan. Me too. And you too. I need those words that Jesus paid it all. We have this tremendous debt of sin. The sin that, that separates us from the, the giver of life, the goodness of our God, that sin separates us and we can't reach up to God. We're just down here, I can't reach up to God. The, 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 the grace of God reaches down to us and pays the debt for our sins. The four most beautiful words in the English language, Jesus paid it all. That's what we've been talking about for the last several weeks. This, this, this wonderful, great gift of salvation. What does it mean to say, I am saved? That our God has this tremendous cosmic plan that, that he put into place before the foundations of the world were laid. And that at the center of this plan are his people, you and me. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he makes us alive so that we can say yes to his plan and yes to being his people. And yes to the idea that Jesus paid, not just for the sins of the world, but for your sins and my sins. And there's absolutely nothing that we can do about it to earn it. It's all because of the grace of God, all of it accomplished in Jesus Christ on that cross and in the empty tomb. And because of the, the gift of faith that we're given 
in God, by God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have this, 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 this union with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. In Romans chapter 6, the early church leader Paul is trying to explain the depth of this, this whole thing called salvation to this early church. And this is what he says in Romans chapter 6 verse 4 and then 7 and 8. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We have a union with Christ so that his death is for us and his life is now for us. And that situation is definite and secure. Brian talked about it last week. We call this justification. It's by the grace of God that we have this great gift so that we are free from sin and death and hell and all the power of that sin we are free by God's grace period done full stop great now what 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 do we do with that what's next you know for the people that Paul was was writing to They ask that question, okay, this is an awesome gift of God, this justification that that we are set free from our sins, but then, then what do we do with that? If by the grace of God, we have been forgiven of our sins, maybe what we should do with it is keep on sinning. Because if God's grace is poured out on me because of my sins, then if I keep on sinning, then God gets to show more grace to me. This is the question that that Paul writes about in in the very first verse of Romans 6. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? Some translations say that grace may abound more and more. It's this idea that if my sin means God has to pour out grace on me to forgive me of my sin, then the more sin I have, the more grace that God gets to show. That's great, isn't it? I mean, come on. And yet there's some people that that's how they live. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church, but Monday through Saturday, I keep on sinning. And you know what's awesome? God's grace covers me. So I'm just going to keep on sinning. And that logic, it kind of, it kind of, you can kind of talk yourself into it. It's like yesterday, um, we got, we got home, we had been on vacation at the beach, and we got home, and, and, and Julie was like really excited to clean the kitchen. Like she got in her mind, she was going to clean the kitchen from top to bottom, and I mean, she went after it, guys. I mean, I'm not talking about just the, the countertops and the ovens. She was getting into the beveling on the cabinets, like, like getting in deep cleaning. That's what we call it, deep cleaning. Does anybody else do this? I didn't even know you could clean the beveling on the cabinets. And she was like going around, and at the end of it, you know what was amazing is she had a big smile on her face that she cleaned the kitchen and it was great. I was like, man, it smells awesome. It looks awesome. Now this logic that the Roman church is trying to put out there would basically be like me saying to my wife, you know, you love cleaning the kitchen so much. You know what I'm going to do tomorrow as a gift for you? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cook a lot of spaghetti and I'm just going to leave the marinara sauce all over the counter. Gift for you. And I'm going to get the cheesiest thing I can and have it explode all over the microwave. Aren't you excited about cleaning the kitchen? That's a quick way to do a divorce, man. I'm telling you right there. But that's the logic. That's the logic that the Roman church is kind of dealing with. Should we just keep on sinning because God loves cleaning up our mess? And isn't it a gift to God that we keep sinning so that he can keep showing the whole universe how gracious he is? Paul asked that question, what shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound more? And his response is, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Now those words, by no means, it's the most emphatic way in the Bible to say something is not true. In the Greek, it's the words meganoita. And and it's basically Paul looking at the Roman church and going, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. That's so dumb. How can you, if you're free from sin and alive in Christ, keep on sinning? Christ has set us free from sin. And so to advocate a position 
that would cause us to go back to sin, to promote a life of sin, is patently stupid. Because if you're doing that, you're still dead in your sins. But since we are free, since we have been given a new life in Christ, then there must be something else we're to do with this great gift of salvation and justification. Verse 4, this is what he says. He says, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, here it is, we too might walk in newness of life. Walk in newness of life. The big fancy church word that we use to talk about that walk in the newness of life that we have in Jesus Christ It's the word sanctification. Now, of all the church words that are out there, sanctification has got to be the most churchy word, right? Like, people will use the term justification out in the world to talk about how they're trying to justify their actions. You know, they're trying to, you know, people will even use the term faith to talk about having trust in something. But next to repentance, nobody outside the church says the word sanctification. Nobody. And basically what sanctification means in this super churchy word is literally to set something aside for a holy purpose. That's what walking in this newness of life is all about. Setting aside our life and every part of it for a holy purpose. You notice in that song that we just sang, Jesus paid it all. What is the very next line? All to him I owe. That's the rest of the story. Jesus paid the debt of our sin. Jesus, out of his grace and his love, not because we earned any of it, he he forgave us of our sins. And as a result, out of gratitude and in the freedom of this newness of life, we owe him everything. And the sanctification process is walking in the newness of life so that those words are actually true. That every area of our life we give to God. Every single area we give to God. It's making progress in our faith so that every area of our life is ultimately set aside for holy purpose. You know, we're we're in a generation in a time that really likes to monitor progress. We love to monitor our progress on things. I like to read books on my iPad because at the bottom of the Kindle app, there's a progress bar that tells you how far you've gotten. I love that. I absolutely love that. But the thing I really love the, the most about monitoring uh, progress uh, has to come down to uh, my smartwatch. Now, every, people have, uh, how many smartwatch uh, users do we have in here? Raise your hand up. Okay, so you understand this. I am addicted to those rings right there on the screen. I'm an Apple Watch user. Those are fitness rings. Now, if you are uh, an Apple Watch user, you know what those fitness rings are all about. The outer ring is your move ring. You move so many calories per day, and you can complete that ring. Uh, the, The middle ring is your exercise ring. You get 30 minutes of exercise a day, and that closes the ring. And this is the one that's probably the most pathetic, the the minutes of stand that you have in a day, right? We live in a time where people got to be reminded to stand up. Does anybody else think that's sad? But I'm like that. I'm sitting at my desk and I'm typing away, typing away. And all of a sudden my watch says, you got to stand up, you lazy bum. Um, Get up, get get on your feet. And I got to stand up and I got to start doing my hands. My kids are laughing because they've seen me do this, right? So I get that. I, I like this because scientists somewhere have put together a formula that says if you move uh, so many calories per day over and above your normal kind of limits, if you have so many minutes of exercise per day, if you stand up one minute every hour for 12 hours, then you are progressing in your fitness and health goals. And I love that. I love to be able to see my progress. And sanctification is all about the progress of living into the newness of life that we have in Jesus Christ. Walking in the newness of life that we have in Jesus Christ. This is how Paul describes it in Romans 6 verse 13. He says, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. Now he's talking about members. He's not talking about people. He's talking about parts of your body. 
Everybody has a, 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 a you know, parts, you have your mind, you have your heart, you have your limbs. He says, don't present the parts of your body, your, the members of your body as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. He says, look, walking in a newness of life of Jesus Christ is progressing away from sin, walking away from sin, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. We talked about that as repentance and walking toward righteousness, walking toward holiness, walking towards this moment where we can say all to Jesus I owe and I'm giving it to him. You might say, Zach, you know, righteousness, holiness, you're saying that as a follower of Jesus, I'm supposed to be moving towards holiness and righteousness with my life? That seems like a high water mark. You just said it. I'm a sinner. I just said it. I'm a sinner. I'm not a holy person. I mess up. I screw up all the time. How am I supposed to be progressing towards righteousness and holiness? I am going to fail. I'm going to fail. So why even try? Why even try to walk in this newness of life? Because I'm going to fail. You know, I heard a story about a football coach um, who was trying to get his, his, his players to think about success and failure. And, and I was reminded of this story because it, we're, I don't know if you know this, but college football season is like around the corner, okay? Um, it's a big deal, all right? Patrick Fagan and I just had a conversation about his son at the, the Tennessee Volunteers. God bless him. Um, but I heard this story from, uh, from a football coach who wanted to get his players to kind of think about success and failure. And, and the coach pulled out a big board. Now, I'm going to knock everything off this table, okay? You didn't know that was there, did you? That was pretty good. <laughs> he pulled out this board. And then he, he took the board and he set it on the ground. Board very similar to that. And he said, how many people will walk across this board on the ground? Now, I'm, I haven't done this yet, guys, so I'm just going to fall right off there, okay? Now, I'm going to ask you, how many people on the ground will walk across this board? Seriously? It's on the ground, guys. It's not that big. There's only like five of you that are like, yeah, I'll take the challenge. Um, I'm not, okay, now, I know what you're afraid of. You're, you're afraid I'm actually going to ask you to do it. I'm not going to ask you. I'm not going to ask you to do it. How many people would be willing to walk across this board if it's sitting on the ground? Raise your hands. You could take your shoes off if you're nervous about it. Okay. So the coach put it down. Every player, just like here, except for some of you that are scared. Um, every player raised their hands. Now the coach said, imagine I take this same board. This is a sturdy board. This is a, uh, this is a stud board for those of you guys that know construction. This is very sturdy. Imagine I suspend this uh, above the stadium and it's locked in secure and it, it's suspended above the stadium. How many people are going to walk across this board suspended above the stadium? Now, how many of you, if I put this on the top of the church, secure, same board, it's not going to break if you step on it. How many people, if I put this on the spine of the church's roof, would walk on it? How many? It's the same board. It's the same board as if it's down here. Now, the reason is because what you just saw me do, I fell off. If I fall off here, the consequence is... Oh, now I'm going to make it. Look at that. The consequence is if I fall off here, you guys laugh at me, but I'm not dead. I put it on top of the roof. I fall off. Guess what? Probably dead. Maybe not, but pretty badly injured. It's the same board. And the difference is I'm focused on the result of failure, not success. I'm focused on what happens when I fail rather than what happens if I succeed. See, some of us are hesitant to walk in the newness of life of Jesus Christ because we know it's hard. 
And I'm not going to lie to you. Walking in the newness of life to Jesus Christ is hard. In fact, the Bible sometimes describes it as a war, as a battle. And so we say to ourselves, I can't be righteous. I can't be holy. I'm screwed up. I can barely handle my finances. I can barely handle my children. I can barely handle my job. And now you're saying, if I'm going to walk with Jesus Christ, I'm going to have to walk in the newness of holiness and righteousness. I'm definitely going to fall off. That's 40 feet in the air. That's 400 feet in the air. And I'm going to fall off and I'm going to fail. But here's the thing. We're not walking by ourselves. At the end of uh, a letter in the Bible, a letter written by a guy named Jude. He closes his letter by saying this. He says, now to him who is able, notice this, to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless or righteous or holy before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. To him be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Jude closes his letter this way to point out the fact that our God is full of glory, is full of majesty, is full of dominion. And he's using all that to keep you and me from stumbling. To present us righteous and blameless. We are screwed up on our own. But in Jesus Christ, we already have the success. We already have the victory. He's going to pick us up because he's not just walking with us. He's walking underneath us and around us and above us, holding our hands, holding our shoulders, lifting us up. So that we can progress forward into the sanctification life that God has for us. Knowing that when we mess up, it doesn't matter because Jesus is keeping us from falling. And he's got the power and the glory and the dominion to do it. So to walk in the newness of life with Jesus means that we are guaranteed to be successful if we will trust him. So how do we do that? How do we begin to take steps across this plank, this, this piece of wood called the sanctification life? Well, Paul writes a, a letter to another church, a church in a town called Philippi, and, and he begins to describe this walk and what this walk requires. This is what he says in Philippians 3, beginning with verse 17. He says, brothers and sisters, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I've often told you and now tell you even with tears, they walk as enemies of the cross. Notice the language of walking there. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory. And they glory in their shame with mindsets, minds set on earthly things. See, there's two types of people in the world. Only two. There's people that walk as enemies of the cross and those that walk in the faith of Jesus Christ and the cross. There are those who walk as enemies of the cross and those who walk in faith with Jesus in the cross. And it's a matter of who are we focusing on? Who are we imitating? And right now, you know, we are, we are saturated with people vying to be our heroes, people vying to be at the center of our universes. And we're, we're saturated with people that, that, that are saying constantly, look at me, look at me, posting on Instagram and TikTok, look at me, look at me, posting on Facebook, look at me, look at what I can do. And there are people all across the world vying for our attention to be their heroes, to be someone that we imitate, someone that we focus on. And the question is, are they enemies of the cross or are they walking in faith in Jesus Christ? Christ. Paul says, imitate those who walk in faith. And that means just being saturated, not with everybody who's saying, look at me, look at me. Because as he says, their, their, their God is their belly. Now, I love that line. It doesn't mean that they just want to eat, you know, massive amounts of food at, the, at, the, at, at, at a restaurant. It means that they're so taken with consume, 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 that that's their God. They're so taken with their own glory that that becomes their God. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves as we're walking in the newness of life is who are we focusing on? Who are we imitating? Who are we elevating as heroes? Who are we elevating as people that we want to be like? If we want to walk in the newness of life of Jesus Christ, 
We've got to imitate those who've done it before us. Now, I've started to take to reading a lot of like uh, stories about heroes of, of the Christian faith from the, from the past 2,000 years. And one of the guys I started reading about is a guy named Brother Lawrence. He was a 17th century Carmelite, which basically means he was a monk. And he kind of had lowly jobs um, with his monastery. And he was uh, very unsatisfied with his prayer life. And so he just took it as a mission that everywhere he went, no matter what he did, no matter what task he was given, he was going to be in the presence of God. And one of the tasks that he was given every single day was washing the dishes. I got to tell you guys, I hate washing dishes. I hate it. But I said, look, if Brother Lawrence is, 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 is unsatisfied with his prayer life and he's going to say, I'm going to pray through washing the dishes, knowing that God cares about the, the washing of the dishes, then I look at that and say, I want to be like that too. Or I think of Julian of Norwich. Julian of Norwich ministered uh, during the bubonic plague. And people, they, they, they flocked to her. In the middle of one of the, the most deadly plagues that's ever kind of swept over the planet. We think COVID-19 is bad. It ain't the bubonic plague, guys. And Julian of Norwich was, was a voice and a beacon of hope and comfort. Or C.S. Lewis, who was the voice for the, the people of, of England during World War II. And none of these people were perfect. None of these people were sinless. But they walked the walk with Jesus. Paul says, imitate those who walk as friends of the faith. And, and, and that can be those heroes from church history, but it can also just be walking the walk with people closest to you. Finding people to walk with in your home. Finding people to walk with in this church community. Changing the, the conversations that we have away from just the logistical and focusing on the spiritual. You know, Jules and I, you know, we're like a lot of families. We've got a lot of to-do lists. We've got a lot of calendars. We've got a lot of budget. Uh, uh, school is about to start. I don't know how you guys feel about that, but that just means a whole lot of stuff on our calendar. And a lot of times our, our, our conversations have, have been about the logistics of getting stuff done. But lately, over the last several months, we've been really we're concentrating on changing those conversations away from the logistics and more to the spiritual. What does God want us to be about as a family? What does God want us to be about as a couple? And changing the conversation so that we know we're walking this journey of faith, not by ourselves, but together. Maybe those conversations need to change in your home. And if you don't have somebody in your home to have those conversations with, then find somebody in this church community to have those conversations with. Find an example to walk alongside you. Find an example of faith to walk with you. And Paul goes on to talk about what it, what it means to walk with others. He also talks about what is filling us up as we walk. In the book of Ephesians, he's, he's talking to a church in Ephesus that's just trying to figure out what it means to be the church. And this is what he says. He says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the, the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord. This is for Jennifer and Tyson right now. God bless you guys. With your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. He says, walk. Be careful how you walk. And part of the things that we have to be careful about in how we walk is what's filling us up on our journey, on our walk. Back when um, Caleb was just a little toddler, one of the things that we loved to do was to take him over to Florida Southern College. And he loved running around that campus. Julie and I graduated from Florida Southern, so we loved taking him and kind of, you know, um, showing him that. And he would splash around in the fountain. And I don't think you're supposed to do that, but we let him do that anyway. And, um, and, and one day we, we, we wanted to take him over to Florida Southern, but we had to make a stop at Target. And back in the day, 
there used to not be a Starbucks in the Target. Do you guys remember this? There was a time where there was no Starbucks in the Target, but they did have a little food area. And so because Julie and I had some like shopping that we had to get done and some you know, conversations we had to have about the shopping, we wanted to keep you know, Caleb happy and distracted a little bit. So we went to this little food area and we got him a blue slushy and a bag of popcorn. Okay, you guys remember they used to sell like movie style popcorn and slushies. And so we got him this, this, this popcorn and slushie and we're p- pushing him around Target and he's just sipping away and chomping away, chomping away. And then he says, after we got done, he downed all the popcorn himself, all the slushie himself. He said, I wanna go to Florida Southern. And so we took him to Florida Southern and it was like 95 degrees outside and he's toddling around like this with popcorn and slushie kind of uh, you know, on his stomach. Now I don't have to tell you what happened next. He said, Daddy, pick me up. (laughs) Do I need to fill you in on what happened next? He showed me exactly what was filling him up, all right? But you know this. If you go out hiking, you're not filling yourself up with slushies and popcorn and cake and candy. You got to get some good fuel in your system. And the same thing is true in our walk with the Lord. We're trying to say that we want to progress in in the walk of of this, this life with Jesus, but we're filling ourselves up with a lot of garbage. A lot of garbage. Paul says, be wise, fill yourself up with the wisdom of God, not the foolishness of everything else. Fill yourself up with the praise of the, the Holy Spirit, the praise of our God, not with the, 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 the bitterness and the rage and the anxiety and the angst and the stress of the world. Fill yourself up with the wisdom of God and the praise of God. As we fill ourselves up with the wisdom of God and the praise of God, the walk, as strenuous as it is, as scary as it sometimes can be, becomes a lot more joy-filled and peaceful. You know, we have this great gift called technology. Now, I know we get, a lot, we get jacked up about technology, man. Technology is not the problem. It's what we do with the technology that's the problem. But we have at our disposal, at any given moment, right now, for free, zero dollars. Inflation ain't touching it. We have for free access to dozens upon dozens of translations of the Bible for free, both audio version and what we can read at any given moment. And you know what? We ain't got time for it. We ain't got time. I can doom scroll through the news, but I ain't got time to read a chapter of the Bible. We have the wisdom of Almighty God available at any moment to us, and we ain't got time. We're filling ourselves up with other things. And so how's the walk going? Filling ourselves up with the wisdom of God is so essential to making sure that the walk that we have in the newness of life of Jesus Christ is powerful and strong and joy-filled. What are you filling yourself up with? We have thousands upon thousands of worship songs that can fill our cars and fill our homes at any given moment. What's filling our heart and our souls? You know, one of the things that Jennifer Voigt's been doing, I think it's just been so great, is every single week, guys, she posts on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel, she posts what we're going to be singing on Sunday morning. And, and I, I love it because by Wednesday, Thursday, she posts it. And so for the back half of my week, I'm just focused on not just songs and hymns and spiritual songs, which are all awesome, but I'm focused on the songs and hymns and spiritual songs that we as a community are going to be singing together. And that, that lights me up. It lights me up and it makes the, the walk with Jesus, as strenuous as it sometimes can be, a lot more joy-filled and a lot more peaceful. What's filling us up? And who are we walking with? See, God is calling us to to, to bask in the truth that Jesus paid it all. And he's calling us right now to live a life in such a way that we can say without a doubt and with a yes and amen, all to him I owe and I am going to walk it. I'm not just going to talk it. Today, Jesus promises he's going to walk with us. He's calling us to walk with him. How will we answer his call? Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, 
And what a gift that you've given us. The gift of, of salvation and the gift of justification and all these, these big words, these churchy words. But Lord, it really just comes down to the fact that by your grace, we are forgiven. By your grace, we are made free and whole. By your grace, we're given power to turn from sin, to walk away from our sin, and to towards you in righteousness and holiness. Lord, forgive us when we're afraid, when we, we think that, that, that uh, that's too high a watermark. It's too, too strenuous. It's too difficult. Forgive us when we focus more on our failures than on your success. Forgive us, Lord. Right now, I just ask that you would put on our, our minds and on our hearts the, the things that we need to cast off. Maybe it's people that we've imitated or, or, or we've elevated as heroes. Maybe it's the way we, we talk in our homes or in our offices. And maybe it's what's been filling us up. But Lord, you know there are things that are hindering our walk with you. Show us those things right now and help us to lay them down so that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with praise, filled with your wisdom, walking with those who are committed to walking with you as well. So that we can give you our everything. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.
May that be true for us. You guys can be seated for just a moment. Um, just I want to thank you guys once again for being here this morning and worshiping with us. And if everyone would take a moment, just fill out the little communication card that was on one of your sh- seats around you. And you can just stick them in the boxes on your way out. Just so it lets us know that you're here and gives us a little bit more information about you. And you can also share uh, prayer requests and, and praise reports on the back. We, we really uh, do pray over those every week. And if today's your first Sunday, we invite you to the back table. We've got a free gift for you. And then right after, in the welcome center there's a a, the library we have a 10 minute party where we just love to for you to get to meet some of the church leaders it literally is 10 minutes if you're new just to help you get connected there's lots of ways to get get connected at fpc but that is the first way so we encourage you to uh to to show up there if today's your very first sunday uh let's pray together as we uh depart lord um our prayer is that that we would build our whole lives on the foundation of jesus christ who has uh, given us every good and perfect gift. Lord, let us leave this place committed to walking with you so that we might experience the full life that you promised us, full of peace and joy and love and hope, and, and that we would exhibit that to everyone we meet. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you guys next Sunday.